So first, uh, uh, let's just talk about the diecasting process. And when you use the term diecasting around the world, um, it tends to include any metal cast into a metal mold. So it can, it can include gravity processes, processes where we're pouring the metal with gravity. It can be low pressure processes where we're just using very, very low pressures to fill the mold. Or there's a tilt process, a tilt permanent mold process that also is often included in die casting. But here in North America, we tend to make a, a more careful distinction. Here, die casting is short for high pressure die casting or sometimes high integrity die casting processes. And so these are different from gravity poured processes uh, and these are different from low pressure processes where extremely low pressures are used to fill the cavity. So in North America, die casting or high pressure die casting is injected at very high speed into a reusable steel die and then we use very high pressures applied at the end of injection. Uh, generally the low end of about 3,000 PSI to as high as 20,000 PSI is pushed on the metal once a cavity is filled. And when we look at the total market for metal mold casting processes, by far and away the largest part is high pressure die casting. This is based on pound ship, based on dollar ship. And one statistic that's kind of thrown around a lot is that of all the aluminum castings produced in North America, two-thirds of them are produced by die casting. So all the other casting processes put together, sand casting, investment casting, permanent mold casting, centrifuge casting, loss foam casting. So die casting is obviously a very, very popular process. So as we just talked about, when we talk about die casting, we're talking about castings produced uh, in a die casting machine. And it's a large, complicated, hydraulically and electrical, electrically controlled machine. I'm showing a picture of a machine on the right. And so generally, we use this high pressure to force the liquid metal at high speeds, at high pressures, into reusable steel molds. And so the picture on the right is a, uh, a Beulah Prince die casting machine. I believe it's about a 900 ton machine. And what do we mean by 900 tons? So 900 tons refers to the clamping capacity of the machine. This is the load, the force that we apply to the dies, to the steel dies, to keep them clamped closed as we're injecting the metal into the steel die. Because of the aggressive technique we use to inject the metal, we have to apply very, very high loads to make sure the dies remain closed. And for this, we're using 900 tons, which is about a medium size die casting machine. Okay, so this schematic kind of shows the uh, die casting process. This is actually the coal chamber die casting process, and I'll talk about what that means uh, on the next slide, I believe. Anyway, so in stage one, we have the dies clamped closed. Maybe we're applying the 900 tons or whatever, clamping load to those dies. And then we have this horizontal sleeve, and we ladle liquid metal into the sleeve. Uh, and we can either do that by hand, or more commonly these days, we have an automatic ladling machine. Then the plunger moves forward and it's uh, uh, hydraulically uh, operated and it moves forward under very closely controlled conditions and we inject the metal into the cavity. And so the die cavity is shown here. This is where the metal is being injected into. And then as the metal is solidifying, we continue to press forward with that plunger to apply pressure and uh, the idea is to reduce the amount of porosity in the castings. Once the casting is solidified, the die opens, the blue side of the die moves back, ejector pins, steel ejector pins, push the casting uh, out of the cavity so it's available for either a robot or a pick and place device to come in and grab the casting. Then in the fourth stage, we spray a water-based organic lubricant on the die face. This is basically a parting agent to, to prevent the uh, liquid metal from sticking to the die. Then we clamp the die closed and repeat the process. So as I alluded to on the previous slide, there's actually two major categories of die casting. There's what's called cold chamber die casting. That's shown on the schematic at the top here. And then we've got hot chamber die casting. This is uh, shown on the bottom. And so this uh, slide kind of shows the difference between the two processes. So let's talk about the cold chamber processes. That's the one we reviewed on the previous slide. So again, we have this large diameter cylinder somewhere between three and six inches inside diameter. 
that's called either a shot sleeve, sometimes it's referred to as a cold chamber, which is where the name comes from, and we pour the liquid metal, as we showed on the previous schematic, we pour the metal through a hole into the shot sleeve, and then this hydraulically activated plunger moves forward to inject the liquid metal under very closely controlled conditions into the die cavity, and so the die cavity is shown here in this schematic. Um, however, with some alloys, um, those that are melted at low temperatures, such as most of the zinc alloys and some magnesium alloys, we can actually take this whole injection system, the hydraulic injection system, and we can immerse, at least the metal parts of it, immerse them into the liquid metal in the furnace. And so that's what we're showing here on the bottom. Instead of having this horizontal injection, we've now taken that injection system and we've immersed it into the liquid zinc or the liquid magnesium. And so now the plunger operates downwards and it pushes the metal through what's called a gooseneck, through a nozzle, and then into the die cavity that way. And this is called the hot chamber process, and it's called hot as the injection system is in the hot liquid metal. And so the hot chamber process has got several advantages. We don't lose heat um, in the injection system as we would do with pouring metal into that cold cold chamber, uh, and also allows us to better fill thin wall castings, and also tends to be faster. But the problem is that hot chamber can't be used for some of the die casting alloys. For example, aluminum alloys. Aluminum, liquid aluminum, is very, very aggressive, and so it would dissolve this ferrous injection system if we immersed it into a bath of liquid aluminum as we're showing here for the hot chamber process. For, so for aluminum alloys and some other alloys that we'll define in a minute, we have to use the cold chamber process. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about the cold chamber process. Uh, this shows the alloys that can be cast in the cold chamber process. Um, also, then we can use some limited zinc alloys with the cold chamber process. I should say we have to use the cold chamber process for some of these zinc alloys. ZA12, ZA27, these have got high aluminum concentrations. They're zinc-based alloys, but they have quite high aluminum concentrations. And there's also some magnesium castings have to be produced using the cold chamber process. These tend to be the bigger castings. So, for example, the dashboard of a car is often a one-piece magnesium die casting, and there aren't uh, uh, hot chamber machines big enough to produce that, and so it's uh, produced in a cold chamber machine. So let's move on to the other process. So what are the advantages of the hot chamber die casting process? Well, certainly the alloys we just talked about, uh, we can produce most zinc alloys, uh, such as the Zamac alloys, and we can also produce ZA8. ZA8, as we now know, obviously has 8% aluminum in it, and so that's a lower, lower enough aluminum concentration that it doesn't cause a problem with dissolution. Uh, of the uh, gooseneck, the ferrous base injection system. And then also smaller magnesium castings are then produced um, using the uh, uh, hot chamber process. So the advantages, we've kind of talked about this, uh, better metal temperature control, we're not pouring into that cold shot sleeve, automatic refilling, the minute the plunger moves back, it's automatically refilled, and therefore we get less cooling, less oxidation of the metal as we're injecting it into the